How many of you have heard of C.S. Lewis? In fact, most of you understand the trilogy that he wrote. It was seven books called The Chronicles of Narnia. He also wrote a book called Screw Tape Letters or Mere Christianity or The Problem of Pain. In fact, they took uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and they put it into a motion picture. One of them was The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Probably most of you in here have seen that movie. Well, most of you may not know that C.S. Lewis basically was an Irish writer, and he taught literature at Oxford University and at Cambridge University. He was a very brilliant man, but he was an avid atheist. He did not believe in God. And he was reading several Christian books that were apologetic in nature, and as he began to read, he was convinced about the credibility of Christianity, and according to his own testimony, he came into Christianity kicking and screaming. He said, quote, I was the most reluctant Christian in England, end quote. He became a born-again Christian because he realized the evidence was overwhelming. Well, eventually, he married a woman by the name of Joy Gresham. She was the love of his life, and shortly after they were married, she developed a painful form of bone cancer. And they prayed for her healing, and she was healed. And for a year, the bone cancer went into remission, but then a year later, it reemerged its ugly head, and she died. And during that time, C.S. Lewis wrestled with God. And in one of his books called The Grief Observed, he shares his struggle with God, and here is what he says, quote, when your need is desperate, when all other help is in vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. Not that I'm in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about Him. The conclusion I dread is not so that there is no God after all, but so this is what God's really like. Deceive yourself no longer, end quote. Now, obviously, he worked through his doubt. He worked through his grief, but he struggled with the why question like all of us at times struggle. And in fact, when you and I struggle with the why questions of life, they often fall into three categories. Number one, there are theological or philosophical questions that we often ask. Number two, they may be moral questions that we ask. God, if you're a holy God or you're a good God, why do you allow evil to go on? And then finally, there is emotional questions that we often ask. It's not so much theological as we're suffering, we're hurting, and we want to know why God doesn't alleviate our pain. Well, a prophet that we're studying, he struggled with a why question as well. It was a little different than often what we struggle with, but his name was Habakkuk. So I invite you to turn to Habakkuk chapter 3. This is our final message as we complete the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is an Old Testament prophet, and as I said, many people believe that he was the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. And I've entitled this series that we've been doing in the book of Habakkuk, how to respond to the why questions of life. We all ask those why questions. God, why do you allow suffering? Why do you allow pain in my life? God, I can't figure things out. Sometimes you seem very clear and I see your hand in my life. And at other times, God, you're a mystery to me. It seems like you're hidden. I cannot figure you out. And so, Lord, why do all these things happen? Well, Habakkuk struggled with two why questions in the book of Habakkuk. Why question number one was this, and he asked God, why are you allowing evil in Israel to go unchecked? In other words, evil was running amok in Israel, and Habakkuk had been asking God to deal with the evil, and God seemed to not care about the evil that was running amok within Israel's society. And so God responds to his first question and says, look, Habakkuk, I am answering your prayer. I'm raising up the Babylonians, and I'm going to use them 
to judge my people Israel? Well, that creates a second why question from Habakkuk, and that is this. God, how can you use the Babylonians to judge or chastise your people when they are more evil than your people? I mean, after all, God, you're judging Israel for their sin, so how can you use a more wicked people to chastise your own people? And so God responds to Habakkuk's why question there, and he says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. Yes, they are more evil than my people, but I am going to turn around after using them, and I am going to judge them. Now, unlike Habakkuk, Many times our questions do not get answered in this life. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. We have to wait until eternity before we find out the answer to some of life's most perplexing questions that we have, especially when it relates to evil and suffering. Now, from Habakkuk's questions in his dialogue with God in these three chapters of Habakkuk, What we have done is extrapolated some principles that you and I can use in our life when we are dealing with the why questions of life. Now, let me say at the outset, I understand that sometimes when people are going through suffering, it's not a matter of bullet points. It's not a matter of, well, let me give you a list of principles that you can use when you're going through suffering. Because listen, we all know that when we're hurting, and we're going through a deep valley, sometimes we don't want the principles. We know the principles here. We know that God works all things together for good. We know that theologically if we've been well taught. The problem is emotional. And so I don't want to be very trite this evening and try to say, well, if you just apply these 10 principles, you're somehow going to have all your questions in life answered. You and I know that life doesn't work that way. And when you're dealing with grief or you're helping somebody else process their grief, many times you don't want to spout off, well, here's 10 principles that I'd like to give you, because sometimes you just need to be there for the person. You know, Job's three friends initially, they did a good job. They sat with Job in his grief and they didn't say anything, but you know when the problem came? When they opened their big mouths. Because what they did was they basically said, Job, the reason you're suffering is because there's sin in your life, and they exacerbated the problem. Now, having said that, let me say this. You and I need biblical principles when we're going through suffering because, listen, if we don't have a definitive word, if we don't have principles from the Word of God, what do we have? All we have is floating through life with no sense of anchor and no sense of purpose. And so, ultimately, it is those verses like Romans 8, 29 that comfort us, or Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for good. We do need principles to help us when we are going through the why questions of life. And so what are the principles that we've looked at thus far in the book of Habakkuk? Let me review several of them real quickly. Number one, when dealing with the why questions of life, Share your struggles and questions with God in prayer. Again, I'm not going to elaborate on this. You can listen to the previous messages. Secondly, remember that God is working even when we can't see it. Thirdly, remember God's ways or plans may be different than ours. Number four, we must balance divine sovereignty with human responsibility when it comes to the why questions. We often blame God and we don't put human responsibility on people. Many times people suffer because of bad decisions in their life. Now, sometimes evil is not always moral. There is natural evil. In other words, no one does anything wrong, but a tornado comes and it destroys people and takes out a whole trailer park. That's not moral evil. That's natural evil. People didn't ask for that. They didn't make a bad decision. So I realize human responsibility doesn't really fit into that category. But on many issues of life, you have to balance divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Number five, we said another principle is to focus in on who God is. Number six, spend time with God to hear his voice. Do you remember in chapter two, after Habakkuk asked God, how could you use the Babylonians when they're more evil than your people, the Israelites? And what did Habakkuk do? It says he went into his tower and he waited to hear from God. He got alone alone. 
And when he was alone, God spoke to him and told him, I want you to write down what I'm about to tell you, and I want it proclaimed. And what God told him was Habakkuk chapter 2. And so spend time with God to hear his voice, because there are times where God will speak to us. Now, God may not give us the answer that we're looking for, but here's what God will do. God will speak comfort into your life. He will speak reassurance. He will speak direction. When you are going through deep valleys, God will encourage you during those times. But listen, you have to get alone and hear God speak. Number seven, we said walk by faith. And the famous verse in Habakkuk chapter two, he says, the just shall live by faith. In other words, God wants us to trust him even though we don't see the big picture. Many times all we can see is what's in front of us. God is up in the press box. He sees the game. He sees the plays being played out from beginning to end. Listen, you and I only see the parade going by. We see one float after another going by. God sits above the parade, and he sees the parade from the beginning and the end, and we have to trust him, and sometimes that's difficult to do. And then number eight I shared with you, remember that there is a day of accountability or reckoning coming. Now, if you remember in chapter 2, beginning in verses 5 through 19, after God tells Habakkuk, I'm going to use the Babylonians to chastise my people, then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to punish the Babylonians for what they did to my people. And then God in chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, lists the evils that the Babylonians had lived by and had committed. And he says, this is the reason why I am going to judge them because they are an evil people. And so understand this, we deal with evil in this life, we deal with suffering, we deal with injustice, we deal with miscarriages of justice in the court system. There is coming a day when God is going to recompense all the wrongs done in this life, especially against his people. Listen, there are Christians overseas that suffer unjustly. They are in prison. They are thrown into labor camps. They lose their children. There is coming a day when God is going to vindicate them according to the Bible. Now for this evening, we pick up the ninth principle from the book of Habakkuk in dealing with the why questions. And the ninth principle is this, focus on God's future kingdom. Focus on God's future kingdom. I want you to notice chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. As God is describing his judgment upon Babylon, here is what God says about the Babylonians. Because remember, the Babylonians were a bloodthirsty people. They went after people. Their goal was to conquer and to amass power. And so God says this, is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that peoples toil for fire? And nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You say, Mike, what is he talking about there? God is simply saying that nations toil in vain. And he's talking about nations in general and Babylon in particular because that's the context here. And he's saying that the peoples toil for fire. In other words, Babylon is going after other nations. They want to amass their power. They want to control people. But notice what he says, nations grow weary for nothing. In other words, they are bent on conquest and they want to control the world. But in a sense, they are wearying themselves for nothing. Why? Because man's kingdoms ultimately come to an end. Man's kingdoms will not last because they are ephemeral, they are temporal. On the other hand, notice verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, God is contrasting his kingdom with man's kingdoms. You see, man seeks glory for himself. Man seeks honor for himself. When you look at Russia, why is Russia invading the Ukraine? Because Vladimir Putin is egotistical. He wants to conquer nations. He wants to leave a legacy for himself. But see, that's the vanity of man and his kingdoms. They do not last. But God says, my kingdom, when it comes, 
it will be filled with the knowledge of my glory. And here he's talking about the millennial kingdom into the eternal state. And so what God is saying is, look, get your eyes off of man's kingdoms because they do not last. You are to focus in on my kingdom because when my kingdom comes, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And by the way, we learned that in the book of Daniel. Do you remember the image in chapter 2 if you look at the diagram? Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he saw these metals with this statue and the head of gold represented Babylon, Uh, the chest and shoulders of silver represented the Medes and the Persians, and then of course you had the belly and the thighs here representing Greece, and then you had the legs of iron, Rome, eastern Rome, western Rome, each leg represented the division of Rome, and then of course Daniel sees this huge rock that was not hewn out by human hands, that represents the kingdom of God. Do you remember that in Daniel chapter 2? And what this is saying is, look, all these empires, they had come and now they are gone, and we are waiting the one final world empire. It is the revived Roman Empire that the Antichrist is going to lead. And listen, that stone carved not out of human hands represents the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And what this is saying is that man's kingdoms will not last. Jesus' kingdom ultimately is going to come and destroy all of man's kingdoms. You say, well, Mike, why do I need to focus in on the kingdom of God? Simply this, when you have the why questions in life that are not answered or you're going through suffering, we know that when we enter into that kingdom, all of our questions will be answered. We know that all of our suffering will be done away with. We won't have to go through all the trials and the vicissitudes of life. Why? Because when we get into God's kingdom, we know at that time we are going to have all of our questions answered. And so you and I have to be patient and we have to focus in on God's kingdom. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, John read this several weeks ago in our study of Romans in verse 18, Paul said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. See, whatever we go through in this life is temporal. It's a momentary light affliction compared to eternity. Do you remember the movie Gladiator? If you've never seen the movie, it's a great movie. It's a little bit violent. And of course, Russell Crowe plays Maximus. And he, in the beginning of the movie, he's kind of trying to arouse his troops because they're getting ready to fight I believe the Vandals or the Visigoths or some of those mongrel people. And so he's trying to motivate his troops. And he utters a line in the movie. When I heard it, I thought, man, this has biblical implications. Here is what Maximus, Russell Crowe, said to his troops. Quote, what we do in life echoes for eternity. End quote. In other words... What he said there was what we do in time has impact in eternity. And see, the emphasis is on the eternal, not the temporal. It's not that we don't live here and now. We got to pay bills. We got to raise kids. We enjoy life. All of that is fine. But ultimately, we are living for an eternal kingdom. And so God wants us to focus in on that kingdom. And listen carefully. The only way you know that you are focusing in on that kingdom is by your priorities. I can't tell whether or not the future kingdom of the Lord is your priority. The only way I know that is by looking at your time in your checkbook. That's the only way I know. That's the only way you know because, listen, talk is cheap. You can talk all day about God's kingdom and, oh, I'm focused in on that kingdom, but ultimately it is reflected in your checkbook, it is reflected in how you spend your time and whether or not you spend time with the Lord and you serve Him. Now, I'm not saying that's all you do, but if those things are not your priority, that future kingdom is not your priority. There's a tenth thing that you and I can do when we ask the why questions of life in the book of Habakkuk, and that is this, ask God for mercy. Ask God for mercy. Now we get to chapter 3, verse 1. Habakkuk says this, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to the shiganoth. You say, what's the shiganoth? Well, it was a musical instrument more than likely, and this chapter more than likely was put to music. It was a psalm. 
Now, the word shiganoth could have been a musical instrument, or it could have been a word that means an outburst of praise. And so what you have in chapter 3 is Habakkuk engaging in an outburst of praise. Or it was a musical instrument whereby he put this chapter to music so it was like the Psalms, as it were. But I want you to notice what he prays in verse 2. Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear, O Lord... Revive your work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make it known. And then he says this, underline it, in wrath remember what? Mercy. Now remember, God gave him the answer when he went up on his tower and he said, all right, God, I'm waiting to hear from you. How can you use the Babylonians when they are more evil than your people? He was on his tower and he was waiting for an answer. And here's what God said to Habakkuk in the tower. He said, Habakkuk, I'm going to use the Babylonians, and then I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to judge them for their evil. And so you know what Habakkuk says? He says, God, okay, I accept the fact that you're going to judge Israel, but I want you in your wrath, when you come against us and you use the Babylonians to spank us, God, in your wrath, I want you to remember what? Mercy. And so listen, here's a principle when we go through life and we have the why questions. You know what we desperately need from God many times is mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is God withholding what you and I deserve. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is withholding what we do deserve. To give you an illustration, let's say I have a teenager and the curfew's 12 o'clock midnight. Okay, now it's 1.30 and your teenager is not at home. Some of you can relate to this illustration. And so you blow up their phone, and they're not responding. Their phone is turned off, so everything goes through your mind. And so they finally come home at 2 in the morning. What do they deserve? They deserve wrath. They deserve chastisement. But in the morning, you say, I am not going to punish you and ground you. I am going to show you mercy. In other words, you deserve punishment, I am going to withhold punishment from you. I am going to show you mercy. But not only am I going to show you mercy, you say to your daughter, come with me and I'm going to take you to the mall and buy you $300 worth of clothes. That's grace. That's giving her what she doesn't deserve. All right? So God shows us mercy and he shows us grace. And listen, when you and I are going through difficulty in life, one of the things that we need to ask God when we're dealing with the why questions, we're suffering, we need to say, God, I need mercy. You say, well, what does that mean, I need mercy? In other words, God, please remove the thorn in my life. There's nothing wrong with asking that. Lord, if you're not going to remove the thorn, I'm asking for mercy to give me power to endure. Lord, I'm asking you to lessen the struggle. Lord, I'm asking for mercy so that you will give me wisdom and understanding in the midst of this difficulty. Lord, I'm asking for mercy, for patience and perseverance in my life. Listen, we all need to ask God for mercy. You say, but God knows we need it anyway. But listen, God wants us to ask. He wants us to ask. You know why? Because it shows that we are dependent upon God. Listen, there are some things that God will do for us even when we don't ask. But there are some things, watch this, that God will not do unless we ask him. He wants us to be dependent upon him. I have a good friend in New Jersey. In fact, I'm related to him. And he has a son who got saved years ago. And he's a brilliant young man. He went to Gordon uh, Conwell Theological Seminary in Boston. And he was studying the original language. He was brilliant with the languages. He was going to get his PhD, and he was going to be a professor. He's married. And in the last couple of years, something snapped in his head. And mentally, he went off. His marriage broke up, and he left. They didn't know where he was. And he went through all kinds of struggles. He was on the street. His Facebook posts, I would look at him because I had lunch with him years ago. His Facebook posts were very demonic. And everyone's heart was breaking, like, Lord, what is going on here? Why is he going through this? And I've, I've talked to his dad on a regular basis. I text him, how is your son doing? 
And often I find myself praying for mercy for my friend, his father. I said, what's the latest? And he texted me the other day and he said he went to a mental health thing and then he left the facility. I, don't, I haven't heard from him in months. Now as a parent, you can understand the anguish of that. And so when I pray for my brother, I say, Lord, please help so-and-so, give him mercy. Father, be merciful to his son. God, why don't you heal so-and-so? He was going to go into full-time ministry. You say, Mike, is he saved? I don't know where his heart is. I believe he is saved. But there are things going on, and sometimes we need mercy. Listen, we need to pray for mercy for our country. Because just as God said to Israel, I'm going to bring the Babylonians to chastise, listen, there is coming a day of reckoning for America. You hear me talk about this a lot, and I'm not trying to scare you, but I want to be faithful in my proclamation just to warn us, there is coming a day of reckoning in America. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm here to tell you we need to pray for mercy for this country. You just saw where we passed that gay marriage bill. Or they're in the process of doing that and codifying that. That is another brick in the wall of God's judgment in this country. And listen, we need to pray for mercy for this country. Well, there's an 11th principle that you and I need to apply to our life when we deal with the why questions, and that is this. We need to recount what God has done for us in the past. We need to recount what God has done for us in the past. Notice, if you will, chapter 3, verse 2. He says this in his prayer, Lord... I have heard the report about you, and I fear, O Lord. In other words, Lord, I heard of what you've done in the past in Israel's history, and as a result, I fear you, I reverence you, and I worship you. But then he says this, revive your work in the midst of the years. God, I've heard what you've done in Israel's past and how you've helped Israel, And I reverence you for that, but God, I'm asking you to do it now. In the midst of the years, make it known, in wrath, remember mercy. So in other words, what Habakkuk's doing here is he's recounting what God had done for Israel in the past in terms of Israel's history, and he's saying, God, if you did it for Israel in the past, I want you to do it now for us. In fact, one writer said this, and I quote, Habakkuk had heard of the Lord's dealings in the past with the enemies of his people. Now he asked God to revive his work by punishing his foes and saving his people, end quote. And so here's the next principle when dealing with the why questions of life. You and I need to reflect, recount, or remember what God has done in the past. Why? Why? Because when I remember what God has done in the past in my life, it gives me confidence in the present. When I don't understand, I can look back and say, God, I remember you did this for me. You answered this prayer. You provided for this financial need. You helped me get through that divorce. God, if you did it then, even though I don't understand now, I'm trusting you. And see, that's one of the greatest principles we have is to remember God's past works. Do you remember David in 1 Samuel chapter 17 when he dealt with that big monkey Goliath? Do you remember what David said to Goliath when Goliath was saying, look, I'm going to tear you to pieces, and he says, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds. Well, listen, most of us would have been intimidated by that. And you know what David said? I love it. David said, God delivered me from the hand of the lion and the bear. Therefore, he will deliver me from you. You see what he did? He reflected and recounted God's past deliverances. As many of you know, I grew up in Miami. So I grew up a Dolphins fan, and I grew up a Miami Hurricanes fan. Now, the Hurricanes were basically the team of the 80s. They dominated, and in the last 20 years, they have been terrible. And so they finally hired a new coach, Mario Cristobal. Mario Cristobal played for the Hurricanes in the 80s when they dominated. They were the bad boys. And as people, I even said to my friend the other day, I I wish Miami would just open the jails again so that Miami could be good, but uh, that probably won't happen. So, but anyway, Miami, 
is in a rebuilding process. And I watched this interview with this new coach because I follow the Hurricanes, and here is what Mario Cristobal said. He said, I want to return Miami to its glory days. He said, I remember in the 80s and 90s when we did this, 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 and this. And he said, because of our past, here is what I want to do now. And you know what Habakkuk is saying? Remember what God has done for you in the past. But listen, if you don't have history with God and you don't walk with God, you can't look back on what God has done in your life. You say, but Mike, I'm a new Christian. Well, listen, read the biographies of people in history whom God has worked through. George Mueller. Look at how God answered his prayer with all those orphanages. When you and I reflect on God's past deliverances, what it does is it gives us confidence in the present. Now, let me say this. I'm not saying that if you say, God, you did this, 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 and this, so you have to do this for me now, it doesn't always work that way. Now, what he's going to do here, and we're going to go through this real quick, in chapter 3, verses 3 through 14... He's going to recount God's past deeds in Israel's history, and he's going to give broad strokes, and he's going to use poetic language, and he's going to review some of the events of what God did in Israel's history in the Old Testament. Let me share them with you, broad categories. First of all, he reviews God's power at Mount Sinai. Remember when God brought Israel to Mount Sinai and gave them the law? Notice, if you will, verses three through four. He says this, God came from Teman the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now, Teman and Paran were areas near Mount Sinai. And what happened when God came near to those areas? His glory covered the heavens, and His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays or beams flashed from His hand where his power was hidden. Now, the picture here is God, as it were, holding in his hand the Ten Commandments and the beams of light flashing upon them. So he recounts what God did at Mount Sinai when he gave Israel the Ten Commandments. Then he mentions God's power in the Exodus. Notice what he says in verses 5 through 10. Plague went before him, that is, before God. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. This is poetic language. It's not literal. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapse, but he marches on forever. I saw, verse 7, the tents of Cushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. In other words, when Israel came out of Egypt, these other nations were quaking with fear because God had delivered them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. I saw the tents of Kashan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the stream? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? Verse 9, you uncovered your bow. You called for many arrow, arrows. God is like a warrior here. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains, verse 10, saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. That's when God parted the Red Sea. And so he's using very poetic language, and he's reviewing Israel's past when they got the Ten Commandments. He's reviewing Israel's past when God delivered them out of Egypt. And then finally, he recounts God's power when they entered the Promised Land. Notice, if you will, verse 11. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath, verse 12, you strode through the earth, and in your anger you threshed the nations. That's what Israel did when they went into the promised land. You came out, verse 13, to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched, the wretched who were hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. He's talking here about how they fought in the land of Canaan. And so what he's doing here is he's reviewing Israel's history, and he's giving broad strokes, obviously. He's not recounting everything, but again, the principle is this. When you and I are dealing with the why questions of life, 
and we're dealing with human need, human suffering, you know one of the things we need to do? Remember what God has done in the past because when I remember the past, it gives me confidence in the future. For example, when I'm struggling and I can't see God's hand, Lord, why am I suffering here? Here's what I do. I go back to the Old Testament and I look at the life of Joseph and I see how Joseph suffered. Joseph didn't understand fully what was going on. His brothers betrayed him. Then uh, Potiphar's wife ended up slandering him. He gets thrown into jail. He's forgotten in jail. But what ultimately happened? God exalted him to where he became prime minister of Egypt, second in command. And you know what? When I reflect on that, that gives me confidence that God is working in my life. It gives me confidence that even though I can't see God's hand, I know that he is working even though I don't see all the pieces of the puzzle coming together. You see, reflect on what God has done in the past. That gives you confidence in the future. Well, there's a 12th principle as we wind down, and that is this. When dealing with the why questions, praise the Lord anyway. Praise the Lord anyway. Now, I want you to notice his response. When he finds out that God is going to send the Babylonians to spank his people, Notice Habakkuk's response. He was human like you and I. He said, I heard, and my inward parts trembled. In other words, I was a basket case. I was like nervous jello. He says, I heard, and my inward parts trembled at the sound my lips quivered. In other words, he was grief-stricken. You know, when a person's lip begins to quiver, that means they're an emotional basket case. And then he says, decay entered my bones. In other words, I was kind of like weak. Decay entered my bones. And in my place, I tremble. My knees began to knock. And then he says this, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. He says, man, I got to wait for the Babylonians to come now and to come in and spank us. And you know what? He says, I'm a basket case. I'm nervous. I'm struggling. My bones are like decay. You say, well, why was he like that? Well, listen, how would you be if you heard that the Chinese were going to come and invade America and they were going to take over America? What would you do? Or like me in 1991, when Laura and I heard that Hurricane Andrew was coming and it was barreling down on South Florida, 150 mile an hour sustained winds. I'd never been through a hurricane. I grew up in Miami. I dodged a bullet with Hurricane David. Never been through one. And then Andrew, second year of my marriage, comes into South Florida, 150 mile an hour, literally sustained winds. Destroyed South Florida. It was like a cyclone went through. When you know that's coming, you begin to get a little bit nervous. You say, well, why was he upset? Let me tell you why. Because life would be disrupted when the Babylonians came in. Friends and family would be killed. Creature comforts would be taken away. His people would be hauled off into captivity, and they would lose their national identity. And so he was a basket case. But notice his response. I love it. Verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom. I hate figs. So for me, it would be though the pizza is not being twirled. He says here, though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. Why? Because Babylon would devastate all this. He says in verse 18, yet... I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. There it is. He says, in spite of all of that, in spite of the fact that I am nervous jello, in spite of that, that I'm weak and that my bones are in decay, he says, I'm going to praise the Lord anyway. And so here's a principle, guys. There are things that we don't understand in life, and sometimes we are hurting on the inside, and we offer to God the sacrifice of praise, and we say, God, I don't feel like praising. God, I don't understand. God, I'm hurting, but I want you to know, God, that I praise you anyway because you are sovereign. You are in control.
And that's what we have to do sometimes. And you know what? That sets us free from developing bitterness and anger. Listen, there are Christians overseas whose children have been slain because of their persecutors. It is hard to praise the Lord when that happens, is it not? It is hard to praise the Lord when you're thrown into jail. See, we have it good in this country. And you know what? That's why our sin of complaining is the most wicked. Because we have it so good, I think God sometimes looks down and snickers at us and goes, really, you think you have it bad because your cable was turned off by a storm? We have access to John Wesley, his journals, thankfully. And on April 21st, 1764, here's what he recorded in his journal. John Wesley was the head of the Methodist church. Here's what he said. I visited one who was ill in bed, and after having buried seven of her family in six months, had just heard that the eighth, her beloved husband, was cast away at sea. I asked, do not you fret at any of those things, he asked this woman. She said with a lovely smile upon her pale cheek, oh no, how can I fret at anything which is the will of God? Let him take all besides, he has given me himself. I love, I praise him every moment, end quote. Wow. One final principle tonight as we close. This is number 13 in our list. Depend on God's strength. Depend on God's strength. When we have the why questions, whatever they are, we need to cry out to God for strength. Notice verse 19 as he ends this letter. The Lord God, say it out loud, is my what? There it is. And he has made my feet like hinds feet, and he makes me walk on high places. In other words, just like a deer, God is going to lift him above the circumstance, but he says, the Lord my God is my strength. And listen, when all else fails, people, when we are weak, he is strong. There are times I've been on my face many, many times where I've said, God, I cannot I cannot take another day of this. God, if you don't get me through this, I'm done. And listen, we all have to be dependent upon God. And you know what, Paul? He had that thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he wanted it removed. We don't know what the thorn was. It wasn't a rosebush thorn that we think of. The Greek word is it's a stake. You know, one of those big stakes that you drive through somebody. It was painful. We don't know what it was. Some people think it was blindness. Some people think it was a sin that he struggled with. I think it was the false teachers in Corinth, the ringleader that was tearing up the Corinthian church. We don't know, and it doesn't matter. But Paul said, I prayed three times that the Lord would take it away. God, please get this thorn out of my life. And what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Listen, I had a pastor preach a sermon on that verse, and I love the title of his sermon. The title was this, The Gift Nobody Wants. The Gift Nobody Wants. But listen, it's in those broken times that God's power is manifest. And so what have we learned tonight as we deal with the why questions? We've learned number nine, focus on God's future kingdom. Number 10, ask God for mercy. Number 11, recount what God has done in the past. Number 12, praise the Lord anyway. And then finally, depend on God's strength.